Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the L-2 pre-launch news conference for Space Shuttle Atlantis' STS-135 mission to the International Space Station. Joining me today is Mike Moses, Mission Management Team Chair and Space Shuttle Launch Integration Manager. Good morning. Mike Leinbach, Shuttle Launch Director. Good morning. And Kathy Winters, Shuttle Weather Officer. Good morning. We'll hear from our panelists and then take questions. Mr. Moses. Thanks, Kendra. Well, we had a really smooth uh, mission management team meeting today at the uh, launch minus two day point. Um, standard thing went through the agenda, talked to all the, the parties involved. Nobody has any issues uh, that are in work. Uh, little uh, tech and thing going on at the SLF that they've actually already resolved. Um, um, and I think I just got an email that there's an air conditioner problem in Houston in one of the buildings that they're working on too. So d stuff down in the noise, nothing to really worry about. Although air conditioning in Houston is actually a very big deal. Um, and so, uh, so really good shape. The vehicle's in fantastic shape. Mike's got the, the uh, launch team keyed up and ready to go. They're doing perfect. Everything's on time, on schedule, looking, looking amazing. Uh, it's a great way to head into this, uh, into this countdown. Um, like I said, nothing. We talked about uh, technical issues at all today. Um, we did discuss the weather. I'll let Kathy talk about that with you. But, uh, but it's a straightforward plan for us. We're heading into to Friday's uh, launch attempt, knowing that we have uh, basically the 8th, uh, 9th, and 10th as opportunities. And then we'd have to stand down to let a Delta take the range uh, for a GPS launch. Um, everybody's already asking, do we have plans to make them move and all that? And, and the bottom line is nothing happens until we can't launch, right? So uh, nobody's going to ag agree to things that are planned until there are problems, and there's no problems yet. There's just weather forecasts, and weather forecasts are forecasts. So we'll wait until we get there and see what we get. Um, and uh, and so no, there's nothing planned. Um, you know, I had my phone ringing this morning. The folks at the rental car places at the airport telling everybody we've already scrubbed because the weather forecast was bad, and and we don't do that until we get a little closer, um, and we don't hope to do that at all this time around. So so no plans to do anything. We're going to just go through the count like we usually do. We'll see what we get when we get into the the uh, tanking weather briefing, which is at 1:30 in the morning on Friday, 1:30 a.m. Uh, and before we go load the propellants into the tank, uh, we'll take a look at the weather and make sure it's really a good day to try that. Uh, and so at that point, we'll, we'll be making a decision. So with that, I really don't have anything else to say. It's in, we're in great shape. We're really looking forward to getting this mission underway. Okay, thanks, Mike. Well, the countdown so far is going extremely well. Uh, we're into the uh, loading of the fuel cell system right now. That's the liquid oxygen, the liquid hydrogen that powers those fuel cells. Uh, that should be done uh, around dinner time this evening, and we'll deconfigure from that and get back into other launch pad prep preparations that, at that time. Uh, rotating service structure retract tomorrow afternoon about 2 o'clock. Uh, maybe looking at some weather issues there. Kathy will talk about that. Um, talk to Commander Ferguson. He's, he and his crew are ready to go. They got here um, on the 5th and, and on the 4th, on the 5th, and uh, are ready to go. So that everything is, is looking good there. Um, so no issues at the launch pad. We, we had a very clean meeting, as Mike said, uh, not tracking anything at all that would prevent a, an on-time liftoff Friday morning. So uh, we're feeling good. and. Uh, uh, we'll turn it over to Kathy for the weather forecast. I wish I had better weather for the forecast, but it is not uh, looking favorable right now for launch. We have a tropical wave that's out in the Caribbean, and actually I'll show you a satellite picture. Um, it, it's actually in the Bahamas now. Yesterday we were looking at the same wave in the Caribbean, and it's coming into the Bahamas. And that wave is actually going to come into Florida, you can see on the satellite picture, along with a lot of tropical moisture that's down to the south that's all going to roll in. Um, to Florida in the next couple of days, particularly tomorrow for the wave, but it's not really going to move right through. It's going to, as it comes in, an upper level trough is going to come down and the, the, the actual wave will kind of wash out over Florida, giving us a lot of moisture and a lot of cloud cover. Yesterday I kind of thought maybe we'd have some some decent conditions here along the coast when it came to seeing the vehicle if we were able to get green for launch, but in reality it looks like tomorrow it's going to be pretty cloudy. And I actually backed off of the sea breeze. I think our winds are now going to be from the south, southwest, and um, we're going to have some showers and even potentially some thunderstorms in the area by launch time. So as we get into RSS Retrek tomorrow afternoon, the, you're going to start seeing a more scattered uh, showers, some isolated thunderstorms. We may have to work around some of those when it comes to that operation. And then as we get into the evening hours for tanking, I think some of those thunderstorms are going to calm back down and it'll be mostly showers in the area with a 20% chance of KSC weather uh, preventing tanking. And then as we get to launch, we have a 70% chance of KSC weather preventing launch due to our lightning launch commit criteria violation potential for the cumulus cloud rule and also potential for flight through precip rule, which is actually a, a shuttle specific rule, and then also uh, showers and thunderstorms within 20 nautical miles of the shuttle landing facility. And um, 
the towel sites actually look good. Spaceline Meteorology Group is forecasting good weather at the towel sites. Uh, for us, each day the weather gets a little bit better. We still do have a lot of moisture in the atmosphere over the next few days. Uh, so it's not uh, certainly clean and green, but it does seem to be improving as uh, all that moisture will actually move a little bit more to the north. We're still on the moist side of a weak boundary that's, that's still going to be lingering in the area. It's going to be a little bit more to the north. We're still on the moist side of that, so each day we'll be watching for uh, more of a sea breeze type situation. But as we move forward in time, the, the launch moves earlier, and so the weather conditions continue to improve. So for day two, we did increase the number to a 60% chance of KC weather prohibiting launch on Saturday because we are still very moist. As we get into Sunday, that number is down to a 40% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. So again, that earlier launch time continues to help us. The towel sites do look good on day two. On day three, there is a chance for some thunderstorms within two of the towel sites, and mainly it's due to anvil cloud concerns. Um, so on that day, we'll have to watch, Space Lake Meteorology Group will be watching those. So overall, uh, we are concerned about weather for launch. We do have a 70% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. Kendria? Thank you. When the microphone comes your way, please state your name and affiliation and to whom you're addressing your question. Uh, we could start over here. Um, Kevin, in the front, please. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin Fong, BBC. Y you have to understand we're, we're British, so we only ever talk about the weather. Uh, 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 and you're the most important weather woman in the world for me today. So uh, I just wondered how, uh, how, what it's like to feel the pressure of getting this forecast right, Kathy. Well, um, it'll kind of depend on uh, launch day on how it is. It, really, if it's a very bad situation, it's kind of obvious and will just be red. When it gets uh, interesting is when it's a little more in between. And so then I'll be talking to Mike quite a bit. But I have a whole team. It's not just me there working that. We have a whole team of meteorologists that are working that are trained on the li lightning launch commit criteria and our, our launch criteria. And so there w we have somebody manning the radar, somebody uh, listening to what the aircraft is telling us. Uh, we have people manning all these different positions. So it's really, um, I, w I wouldn't call it pressure, I'd call it exciting. It's really more of an exciting situation we get into. Um, it's, not, it's not really, I guess, a feeling like stress until maybe afterwards and you're kind of big let down if you do happen to scrub. <laughs> but, but so that's kind of how it, how it is. Marsha. Um, <clears throat> Marsha Den, Associated Press um, for Mike Moses. How bad of a forecast would you have to see it and not even bother tanking Friday morning? And for either of the mics, do, do you get a sense, any sense at all, that your workforce wouldn't mind to see a nice big couple of scrubs so that they could stay employed longer? <laughs> Let's see, to answer the second one, it's a definite no. Uh, we are not at all in the, in the mode that, uh, that, that taking more time to make this launch happen is a good thing. Um, the team's ready, they're, they're prepared, everything's in the right spot. This is a normal countdown for us. It's time to go, uh, and so we're, we're more than ready. Um, so there's no, no feeling of, of a scrub is a good thing. Um, the, uh, as to for how bad the forecast has to be, um, I, I, uh, I only know of one way to make it a 100% no-go forecast, and that's to not put propellant in the tank. So um, I'll leave it at that. So yeah. I've tanked before at 70% no-go. The program we've tanked at 90% no-go and, and launched that day. We've also tanked at 20% go and scrubbed that day. So the forecast is a forecast. And even 12 hours out, it's still a forecast. Yeah, it really kind of depends on my mind, too, and Mike and I talk about it a lot before tanking. It depends on my mind on the, on the confidence of the forecast that, that we hear from Kathy and her team. If it's been a, a steady forecast for a couple, three days and, and uh, has a lot of confidence in that, then, then we can pretty much take that to the bank, even though it's another 10 hours away. If it's waffling back and forth between the models, then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'd be more inclined to give it a shot and, and see what we get at T0. Uh, relative to the team, it, it's like game day, a big, uh, a big sporting event game day. Um, Friday is game day for us, so we don't want to see. It. We don't want to wait for Saturday. We want to. We want to play the game Friday. Mark. Mark Kirkman, Interspace News for uh, Mike Moses. Uh, just to recap on what you're thinking going into getting that extra mission day. If, if you delay and can't and you have to go Saturday, is there any way to regain that day without, with the loss of that PRSD? And let's, with the forecast looking like it is for Saturday and better option Sunday, would you let uh, the desire to get that extra day back drive you into 48 hours and maybe top off the PRSD? Yeah, so uh, the math ahead of time shows if, you, if we try on the 8th and then scrub and go on the 9th, um, 
will be will be a little short. I forget the exact numbers, but it's in the four hour range short of uh, getting that extra day. Um, but that's still based on predicted consumables. We might find that the uh, the uh, the mid deck payloads don't use as much power as we were planning. Uh, the crew uh, we budget uh, certain. Uh, you know, it'd be like thinking about trying to predict ahead of time. Uh, exactly how many lights you're going to have on your house at every given minute of every day. We kind of take an assumption the crew may or may not follow that that assumption. So we're going to go ahead and press uh, with the uh, keeping the MPLM shell heaters off with the anticipation that we'll continue to buy back propellant or cryo, uh, cryo for the uh, fuel cells. And uh, and so we'll still try for that. Um, and as we talked at FRR, um, it's a, it's highly desired to get the extra day, but it's not going to drive us to do anything like like uh, do a top off if we don't really have to. We'll go ahead and, and let the vehicle sit on the pad and, and boil off if that's the right thing to do to give us the right number of launch attempts. So, um, but if we knew we had a big stand down coming, we would obviously take that opportunity to top off. 48 is a very tight push. Mike will tell you that yeah. that's, it's a, like a 49 hour operation on a 48 hour timeline. So uh, just doing it because is not really the right answer. So we would not ask them to do that for that reason. Yeah, we, we've looked at it over and over again. In fact, we've only ever done it once, is top off a single commodity in, in 48 hours. And, and it was very, very tight. We made it that time, but, but as I tell Mike, you know, we just can't guarantee that. We'll give it the best shot if, if that's what we, what we choose to do. But there's no guarantee you can even get it done. Okay. Jim. Jim Siegel, Celebration Independent uh, newspaper. Uh, I understand that um, a number of uh, compartments have been put aside for mementos and that sort of thing on the flight, and I wondered if you could give us a, a rundown, if you know, of the kinds of things that are going to be carried aboard the shuttle, especially anything kind of unique, this being the uh, the last mission. Okay. Um, Kendra, you want to answer that one? I'm not, I actually, we can get a, get you a list, and there will be an extensive payload briefing tomorrow at the L-1 countdown status briefing. So we can get that for you afterward. Yeah, I don't have the specifics. Okay, um, we'll come over here now. Uh, second row, please. John Bisney, Sirius XM Satellite Radio. Mike, is there a sense among the team, we've done this so many times before. This is the last one. Many more eyes are on us. Thank goodness nothing's biting us. Well, I'll, I guess this Mike will answer that. <laughs> right. um, you know, it, when, when you get on console in the control room on launch day, uh, we're, we're oblivious to the outside world looking at us, and, that, and that's an absolute truism. Uh, we have our jobs to do, and we're concentrated. We're very serious about it, obviously. So leading into it, yeah, we know there's a lot more interest in the final launch, but uh, when we're on console Friday morning, um, it's going to be like any other launch. We'll, we will launch if the vehicle is ready, and we won't if it's not. I, I, I guess the sense of my question was sort of a professional pride that, thank goodness, nothing's biting us. We've done our job so well that here we are looking at the weather as the only showstopper. You know, that's, that's a funny one, too, because we always want to have something to talk about. And, and <laughs> if there's absolutely nothing, then, then we start to really worry. So at, at, at the uh, mission management team briefing this morning, I talked about a little issue with our TACAN system out at the SLF. This is an issue we have probably 20 percent of the time with the TACAN system. But it was the only thing to talk about, so we did. Um, it, uh, it's the type of thing where, you know, we're all engineers and we, we need something to worry about. And uh, so that, that was today's worry. It's, it's fixed, by the way. <laughs> yeah, David Shuckman, BBC News, another Brit obsessed with the weather. Uh, could you just talk through the process of if you, at 1.30 a.m. on Friday, start the tanking, how difficult is it to stop it if, you, if the weather changes? Question for anybody. So let's see. So yeah, we have a couple decision point milestones, and, and the, the decision to start the tanking or not, actually, the, we can even back up further. So tomorrow, whether we retract the RSS or not and, and roll the RSS back is a weather, there's weather criteria that go with that go, no go decision. And we can delay it quite a bit, as we've practiced a lot lately, um, and, uh, and still make that. So that's obviously that has to get done and, and to, to support the timeline to be ready to start tanking. At, uh, at 2 a.m. tomorrow m or uh, Friday morning. So then right before we start that, we'll have a decision to say, hey, before we go through the act of doing this, because it is a, a big hazardous operation, do we have a, a better than decent chance of launching that day? And are there any other considerations to say maybe there's a better day coming and we want to save that chance to go? Um, once we start tanking, at that point, we'd pretty much proceed on. We wouldn't have decided to do it unless we thought the weather was going to be good. Um, if there's, there's, there's commit criteria that have to be satisfied as you go, weather-related, that could... Uh, stop us. I think it's only within the first half hour, Mike. First hour. Yeah, first hour that the lightning lightning rules apply. Um, and so after that, we really switch into a, um, a, a launch commit criteria. There's a, there's a series of, you call them red light, green light gates that have to be passed. And as long as everything's green, 
we proceed on. Even though the ultimate launch weather might still be showing red, we'd go right up until whatever milestone we chose to say we don't want to go behind. Usually we call that at T-minus nine minutes. Um, one thing Mike and I have talked about that because of the traffic concerns on a scrub, we don't know that we could get everybody back 24 hours later and have the whole team ready to support with all the traffic delays getting home. Uh, if we get inside of about four hours or so, we might want to scrub out for 48 hours instead of just 24. So if at the four-hour mark, we're going to take another look at the weather, and if it still really truly looks horrible and there is just no chance of going, we might choose then to scrub, something we probably wouldn't have done in the past uh, because we didn't have this traffic concern. So there's all those little milestones that Mike and I will have as we make our decisions as we go on, but there's no real, oh, the weather's too bad, stop right now kind of call until you get actual launch weather on the, on the T-0 the actual second of launch. Okay, uh, back over here with Bill, please. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS News, with two quick ones. One for Kathy, is, is this the kind of weather that can generate hail once the RSS is back? Uh, no, it's more of a tropical type uh, air mass. So we're moist all the way through the profile. Usually if we have some dry air aloft and some cooler air aloft, we're watching for hail. But in this case, we're pretty warm aloft for the next several days, and we're also very moist all the way through the profile. So we're really not looking for severe weather at all with this system. We're looking just more just a lot of nuisance weather. Thanks. And one for Mike Leinbach, I know that on launch day when you guys are in the firing room, you focus. I understand that completely, but you're not in the firing room right now. And when you drive to work, I'm just wondering what you're thinking about um, as this final launch campaign drives down. I mean, you know, I mean, just driving in the day, I was looking at the VAB and looking at people and thinking this is going to be different very soon. Uh, what is the mood like out there? Uh, well, you, you know, as I described the other day, it's, it's, it's getting more and more somber the closer we're getting to the end of the program. Um, you know, there are people, uh, millions of people in this country that have, have grown up with the shuttle program and, and have never been alive without the shuttle flying. Any, anyone under the age of 30 has always had the shuttle program as, as, as a part of Americana, and that we won't have anymore. And, and uh, so it, it, I think it, it, it touches people outside the Space Center uh, to a degree as well. Um, inside the Space Center, it's, it's going to be significantly different. Uh, we'll be preparing for the next program, and hopefully we get definition on that relatively soon. And uh, we'll get, a, get on the business about preparing the Space Center for the next, the next program. Um, it, 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 uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's getting more and more somber the closer it gets. And, uh, but that doesn't detract from the professionalism and cohesiveness of this team that uh, I've grown to love so much over the years. Okay, Irene, please. Thanks. Uh, Irene Klotz with Reuters. I have two questions. Um, for, for Mike Leinbach, uh, what's the plan for uh, Pad 39A after launch? Um, will you guys have people go in and do inspections and make repairs, or do you just leave it until uh, something, uh, there's some directive of what to do with it? Well, let's see. We'll, we'll go through our standard post-launch safing and securing operations. We, we uh, send out a team of about 50 folks, um, maybe on the order of 45 minutes or so after launch to make sure there are no leaks or fires, that type of thing. If there's any damage, we'll repair that damage just to keep the systems in good shape. Uh, from an agency perspective, what, what we're being asked to do is keep Pad A in, in, uh, in shuttle shape, is the way I describe it. Don't, you know, we're not going to start dismantling Pad A right away. We, we need to keep it in, in a roughly shuttle shape in case the next program could utilize some of those facilities out there. Unlike Pad B, where we're taking it all the way down to the ground. So we're, we're going to have a clean pad off Pad B if anyone wants to uh, come and launch off that pad with their own mobile launcher and their own tower and their own services. And then Pad A will remain relatively the same for, for a period of time. And I, I can't tell you that period of time yet. Um, but we, we will not go right into a, an immediate demolition of Pad A by any means. Um, and the que next question is for either of you. Um, aside from talking about tack ends, did you uh, was there any comments to the team either before the start of the count or at the MMT today that um, that put some framework and some context for this being the last flight? You have any pre test no, So at the MMT today, we we didn't. Uh, at the very end, I. I uh, I gave the team just a reminder that uh, there's a lot of distractions and, and uh, you know, their jobs to make sure their teams got what they need and, and are ready to talk um, and just stay on our normal processes and procedures. Uh, that one thing that helps minimize those distractions is just treat this as business as usual. So no, nothing about uh, uh, a speech about this being last launch. And I, I, I'll add a little bit in the uh, pretest briefing. I, I consciously told and told myself not to uh, not to uh, lecture the team. I, we, we've been told so often over the last three to six months to a year to focus, focus, focus. And uh, we are focused. We don't need to be told that again. And, and so I didn't want to lay that on my team again. Okay, 
James. James Dean with Florida Today. Uh, Mike Moses, the shuttle flying up crew and, and cargo to serve as a space station, kind of what it was originally in, intended to do. I imagined that, that it would do in, in its concept when it, when, when it was uh, uh, just an idea, you know, decades ago. Um, so I guess maybe a little strange to be ending while it's performing that service, but do you see some uh, maybe symbolism or satisfaction in it in the last mission kind of doing exactly what uh, the the goal was from the start? Yeah, you, you, you look back at the one of the original design features of the shuttle was to be able to enable the construction of a, of a space station, and we did just that, uh, and we built a, built a heck of a national asset up in orbit uh, and a national laboratory uh, and an international uh, asset, too. Um, shouldn't just focus on the, the American part of this. It's, a, it's truly an international partnership. Um, that alone is is a great legacy of the shuttle program in that we enabled the construction of that of that facility. So yeah, there is some poetic uh, uh, completeness to the fact that uh, that we're basically going to go stock it up for a year and and ensure its viability uh, in the coming in the coming times while the uh, the next generation of service craft get up there to to take care of the space station. And Mike Leinbach, uh, how? Um important will it be uh, if, if we're fortunate enough to get a Florida landing assuming you you get off uh, first um, you know how what do you think your feelings will be uh, just getting Atlantis back as as you know our shuttle as, as we're calling it um, for, for you personally uh, your teammates uh, who will uh, you know yeah. still be here before uh, for, for wheel stop and all um, to just knowing that's that's the vehicle that's staying here um, um, how, how Important will that be to, to see it come here? If, if well, Atlantis, Atlantis will be home for the for the duration of of her life, to be sure. And uh, I think I speak for everyone at KSC that it would really stink if we landed out west this time. <laughs> um, <I mean>. But <laughs> but uh, the entry flight director Tony, he'll do the right thing. And if, and if we go west, we go west. That's fine. Um, but we all want to see Atlantis come home here and, and celebrate with the crew when they get off the vehicle. And, and uh, be able to look at Atlantis and the, and the great things she's done over her career and, and be thankful that she's home safe. Okay. I will go over here on the end, please. Uh, Sawyer Rosenstein for Talking Space for either Mike. Um, I was wondering, besides um, you know, bringing up supplies and uh, made the extra days added for the, uh, the load on the four-person crew, um, I was wondering if there was anything that you plan to do differently when the shuttle is at the station than you would normally do on a mission. Let's see, there's um, uh, some of the timeline sequencing has changed just a little bit to accommodate that four-person crew, uh, but most of the tasks are done on the same days that they would be done. Um, most notably is the, uh, the, the TPS, the thermal protection inspections we do on flight day two, and then after we undock, um, that's a very intensive robotic operation, and we usually uh, have that timelined, and typically when we lay out the timeline, it runs for six to seven hours, and we schedule a, an hour lunch break for the crew, but they typically work right through it and just trade off crewmen. On a four-person crew, we, we actually expect them to stop and eat lunch rather than continue to work through lunch. Um, so that's probably the most notable difference. Um, the rendezvous profile is all the same. The, 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 the tools they, they'll use and the way they execute will all be the same. Um, one thing we're doing different, which doesn't have anything to do with the four-person crew, but after we undock, when we do a fly-around, normally we do the fly-around around the x-axis, and you see the solar rays pointing straight out as we fly around. Uh, this time we're going to back out and let the station turn 90 degrees, point that long truss at us, and then fly around the long axis of the station and just give us a different set of engineering views. There's hardware out on the ends of those trusses that we don't get very high-resolution photos all the time. And so this will be the last chance to get some good documentation. Uh, you know, we learn a lot. That fly around looks real pretty and it lets us take pictures, but it's got a true engineering purpose. And it, it evaluates the state and the health of all those things outside. There's a, the, uh, the atomic oxygen environment, the micrometeorite debris or, or environment on the outside of the station. is, is uh, It's a hazardous environment up there, and we'd like to know what's, what's the condition the, the station's in. So that's a unique thing we're doing on this mission, uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with a four-person crew. It is just uh, the chance to do that. So that's really, that's really it for this mission. Uh, Tarek. Thank you. Uh, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com. I think I have uh, two quick ones. Uh, first for Kathy, I'm just wondering, you know, you've talked a lot about the weather. Um, for those of us that maybe don't live in Florida all the time, I'm just wondering, is it is it typical? Is it strange? Is it uh, is it just what you'd expect for uh, a July in, uh, in Florida? It, it is pretty typical. We get these easterly waves, you know, um, later in the season, they might even become something tropical. Um, in this case, it's it is a tropical way, but it's not going to develop into anything more than that. 
and um, they just roll in and we tend to get a lot of rain with them. Um, not as much lightning as we would on a typical afternoon thunderstorm day, but it is not unusual for us to get these easterly waves through and have them come into the area and give us a lot of weather. Thank you. And uh, uh, from Mike Leinbach, um, you know, I'm just wondering, it is the last shuttle mission and I know that the schedule's relatively busy as you guys count down, but I'm wondering if you or any of your team, if anyone's taking the time when they've got it to either just you know, gaze at the shuttle, or maybe go out and do a, a last walk down, give it a pat uh, if you have a chance. Um, you know, is there anything like that that you're, you're doing or would you like to? We've done quite a few things like that already, Tark. We, we uh, of course, were rollout. Uh, well, even before rollout, when Atlantis came over to the vehicle assembly building from the, from the OPF, we stopped for a couple hours, several hours, and, and, and had people stand up next to the vehicle and, and get pictures of themselves or their team with the vehicle. You know, we had the, the rollout event the night of, of rollout where we lit the vehicle up with the Xenons and had, uh, had family members, over 3,500, I believe it was, family members out here watching the rollout. Out at the launch pad, we've had special walk downs. Uh, when we got to the pad, we left the, the RSS retracted for a period of time so we could take more pictures. So, and, and that's been common for the last three vehicles, all, all the, the lasts, um, not just Atlantis. So we, we've made a conscious effort to, uh, to celebrate these machines and, and, uh, and have people come out and view them and, and have their picture taken. And a lot of times it's, it's people that don't get to work on the, on the vehicles. It, it could be you know, folks in the headquarters building or, or elsewhere around the center that uh, don't typically get to interact with the vehicles and it, it makes a very special day for them. So we've, we've gone uh, quite the extra mile to make sure that, that uh, people are able to celebrate this fantastic machine. Todd. Halverson of uh, Florida today for Mike Leinbach. Um, Charlie Bolden at uh, the National Press Club last Friday uh, hinted at the possibility that uh, commercial companies may be taking up residence in uh, the orbiter processing facility bays. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the facilities here and their potential utilizations by next generation spaceships. Well, see, there have been no, uh, no deals cut yet for any of our facilities. There are negotiations going on with some companies that I'm not at liberty to, to, to address. Personally, I'd, I'd love to see the facilities used. Um, the worst thing you can do with a, a facility like the OPF or the VAB or a launch pad is to leave it empty and, and unoccupied and unused. And so if, if we can attract other customers there, I'd, I'd be the first one to go up there and help them in and, and cut the ribbon because I, I, I think it's, it's a capability that this country has that uh, is going to transition from the government shuttle program to uh, potentially and, and hopefully other users. And, and so I'll be the first one to welcome them here and, and uh, help them in any way I can. Okay, uh, if we can come over here, please, to Ken. Hi, Ken Kramer, uh, Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine. Question for both Mike's, uh, first Mike Moses. Um, is there any update on the, on the valve leak, finding a root cause? You had only that very small particle. And for Mike Leinbach, may, maybe you answered this already, but I, I think at the last conference you said uh, you were going to go yourself out to the pad and think about it and consider, and I wonder if you could tell us a little about, about your feelings there. Thanks. See, on the valve, uh, no, no updates. Uh, they found that one piece of debris, uh, not enough to call it an actual root cause, but it is a most probable. Uh, so no, no update on that. Uh, the valve replacement has passed all its leak checks, and we did our flight readiness test, uh, and uh, that all passed as well. So we expect we're in really good shape on the, on the valve replacement on the main engine. Well, see, and, and I had a chance to go out to the, to the pad to look at the last one, one last time in the vertical, and um, it, was, it was kind of emotional. You know, I... I Personally, my story, I, I applied to NASA in 84 after President Reagan proposed the, uh, the, inter the, the first permanently manned space station. And so I've, I've been uh, very, very lucky in my career. Um, I looked at some of the structures at the launch pad that I worked on when I first got hired in, in as a structural engineer at the launch pad, um, and of course the vehicle. Um, so I, I've been one of the luckiest guys in, this, in the world, and, and I took the opportunity to go out by myself and, and just spend a couple hours and look around. and and feel good about things. Okay, over here on the wall, please. Yes, good morning. Um, Honoured to be here. Uh, Matt Pavlidich from the Radio Network New Zealand. Um, for whoever wants to answer this, uh, the lifelong inspiration that this program has provided uh, is one of the reasons that uh, I'm here today. Um, to anybody who wants to give an anecdote, have you received any international correspondence of, of any great measure letting you know how much this has meant to people? And uh, is that, do you think that will continue? 
Let's see. I've gotten uh, quite a few things, both uh, internationally and nationally. That, that that same thing. It's a, it's a, it's amazing how it's it's not just a it's not uh, the American space shuttle. It's a space shuttle that goes into orbit and it's it's orbiting Earth and and and. Uh, it's kind of a unique thing that it, it gives you a lot of pride in what you're doing that that you're able to help uh, help inspire folks that way. Um, and so, uh, yeah, gotten a, a fair bit of, of congratulatory uh, and good luck messages. Um, nothing that I would call remarkable or, or, or out of family, but uh, uh, but I was very happy to get them and uh, and very much appreciate the support. You know, it's one of those things you look back and it is that inspiration. It's it, if it's why you're here today, it's most certainly why I'm here today too. So. Very nice. Um, James, you have a follow-up? James Dean, Florida Today, Mike Leinbach. Um, what do you think is going to be kind of the image um, that you'll hold in your memory of, of this final launch? I mean, you've seen so many launches, each one special in its own way, I guess. But, you know, this is it. What do you think is going to be the lasting lasting impression, whether it's uh, uh, engine start or clearing the tower or somewhere from there? Well. I hope it's not like the last launch where we only saw it for 22 seconds. <laughs> <coughs> Kathy. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm hoping she's really blowing this forecast big time. And, uh, and we'll have a nice clear day. That doesn't seem like that's in the cards, but uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it's going to be, it's gonna be a, a, an emotional day when it's all over. We'll, we'll say a few speeches in the firing room. and and uh, recognize the contribution of the team and, and some special people, I, I suspect, and, uh, and then go have beans and cornbread for the last time. And then, you know, we, the team's going to do the same thing we always do, too, is not lose focus that it doesn't end until landing. And so uh, we're going to stay sharp and, and, uh, and pay attention to what we need to. Like Mike said, the team will go out and do its normal pad safing. That we can find stuff there that might be an indication of a problem that we, we want to investigate further. We'll get the boosters back and get them into harbor. So a lot of the standard stuff will happen. And so, yeah, the takeaway is it, launch is going to be a, a memory, but it's, it's the act of the entire mission, I think, that at the end of it, it's just going to be a conglomerate memory of the, of the last. Uh, here in the back, please. Oh, Keith Cowling, NASAWatch.com. Two questions for Mike Leinbach. Um, first of all, just playing on the issue of keeping things shuttle ready, does that mean driving crawlers around, opening doors, using hoists? Is this and just a wag as to what you think that is in terms of how many people and how long that will go on? And second question, you're the sort of guy that always struck me as just going to work and doing his job and normally would never deter from, you know where I'm going, uh, from saying what you mean even though you'd like to and you did the about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And a lot of people heard about it and I've heard a lot of very interesting comments back. Uh, particulars of what you said aside, what was it like, what did your troops say to you once you, you know, finally said, you know, this is what I think? It must have been a little unusual for you to be in that situation. I'll say first question. Uh, we will have a, a, a certain amount of workforce here to, to keep the crawlers running, just as you say. Uh, we're, we're literally going through that assessment right now. Uh, the, first, the first time we went through that assessment, I think we were a bit low on the number of people that we, we really thought we needed. Uh, and it, it's everything you just mentioned. It's the doors on the VAB, it's the cranes, it's the crawlers, it's, the, it's the, all the facilities, air conditioning, all that stuff. And so we're going through a reassessment of, their, of, of that and uh, may come out with a, a bit more workforce than uh, we originally thought, but it's not going to be a heck of a lot more. Um, and those days, uh, those comments I made on, uh, on that day of that launch countdown sim, you know, I'd, I've been a member of the launch team in one capacity or another for 22 years, um, the last 11 of which as a launch director. And those comments that day were meant to be private between me and my launch team, and, and uh, so they were, they were, they were made. And, uh, my team appreciated them. Dan. Dan Billow from WESH TV for Mike Moses. We heard a little bit yesterday in the countdown status briefing about picking the best two out of three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Would you discuss your philosophy uh, of doing that, if that's what you're doing, and aren't Saturday and Sunday the two best days? Um, yeah, so the problem is no forecast is created equal. Every, every forecast is a little different. And like Mike said, one of the big things we do between the L-3 day forecast and the tanking day forecast is look at how that forecast stayed accurate. And, and is, are the trends that we're predicting actually showing up? Is the pattern each day what we think it is? Or are there some unusual things coming back? And, and Kathy has an unbelievably tough job to forecast the weather, and, and the weather's not you know, under her control, much as we'd like it to be. Um, and so, 
So it just comes down to evaluating how much do you put faith in that forecast based on the opportunities you have. At the end of the day, ultimately, there is no harm in not launching in front of this delta. And if we have to go to the other side of it, we'll go to the other side of it. It it has impacts. It has rescheduling problems. It has a whole bunch of things we have to do, but there's no safety risk in moving to the other side of that delta. Um, so picking the best two out of three, it's not like it's the last chance I have and I'll never try it again. And so I'm not letting that factor in, in too much. Um, but literally, it comes down to playing the what other factors are there, how well is that forecast holding. Um, you know, not to pick apart the forecast, but if this is this actually isn't a bad one. If it's just cumulus clouds and rain showers, um, as long as we get a hole over the pad, that means we're not going to fly through any, and there's nothing within a 20-mile circle headed towards the pad, that'll be a go day for us. And it could be pouring rain everywhere else in the county. And if we get that hole in the right spot at the right time, we can go. And so from that standpoint, right now, I'm feeling pretty good about trying Friday. Um, but we're not at Friday yet, so I'm not going to commit to anything until we get to Friday. And even then, we got... 12 more hours before we actually have to commit. So, uh, so it's a tough job, uh, and there's a lot of things that make it seem hard. It kind of actually boils down to be pretty easy. Um, like I said, the only way to make sure we don't launch that day is to not try. Doesn't mean I'm just going to try willy-nilly. So. Okay. Uh, Ken, you have a follow-up? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Ken Kramer, Space Flight Magazine. I wonder if there is any chance during the spacewalk that um, – the astronauts would use this fisheye lens to get a, a picture of uh, Atlantis on the last flight. And if you could both talk about a little bit destinations, where you would like to go in the future. Thanks. Well, let's see. The uh, I don't know if they're going to be taking that camera out. Um, based on where they're going on the truss, I'm not sure we're headed out to the ends anymore. So we, we knew we were doing that on that, uh, that mission. And so that's why we took that lens along with us. We were going to be at the top of the truss looking down. So I don't know specifically if they plan on any special... Uh, photo ops. This is the station crew doing the EVA um, with their gear, so I'm not sure exactly what they have planned. Um, as far as destinations, um, in the very short term, I'm looking forward to a vacation. Um, in the long term, from a, from an agency, you mean where the agency is going to go as a destination? Yeah, to me, um, the path we're on is 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 probably the right one. You got to take it in steps and, and bite off as you go. You got to learn to 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 walk before you run. Going straight to Mars is a massive challenge. You got to learn. Uh, what you're doing as you get there. The station is a great test bed for that. A perfect example is we have some really good, robust uh, life control or life support systems up on station, both the Russian and the American versions. But if you look at them, they require fairly constant maintenance and fairly often uh, need uh, need parts sent back up. And you couldn't take that system to Mars as is and, and not have to have a tractor trailer full of of parts falling along behind you. So we have a, still a lot to learn before we get a life support system capable of taking us all the way to Mars without a lot of maintenance. And that's just one example. Uh, the propulsion, the, the habitats, the EVA suits, all that has to evolve. So as you go, uh, you, can, you can do that. But kind of like we did in the spirit in the, back in the Apollo days, you don't have to have everything before you go out into deep space. You could go do a flyby. You could do a, a near-Earth object uh, mission. We joke that uh, Sometimes the moon is a four-letter word at NASA, but the moon's a near-Earth object. So, you know, it all depends on what objective you're really trying to satisfy that day. And so to me, personally, I think the destination isn't as important as much as it is the objective of the next step. What technology do we need to prove that we're ready to go to the next step? Let's go demonstrate it, test it out, and then go for the next place beyond that. Uh, otherwise, you get a little too focused on the make everything work all for one thing, and you kind of do lose sight of the well, we could take little steps and maybe go some different directions and still accomplish a whole lot. We don't have to wait five years before we launch. We might be able to do a couple launches between now and then. And, and the agency is most definitely thinking about that. You see that in our – we're not picking a specific destination. We're talking about a, a myriad of destinations. And personally, I think that's not a bad idea. It lacks a little bit of the unifying focus of a mission. We do ultimately have that focus. It's Mars. It's just going to take us a while to get there, and we don't want to run right to the finish line. Uh, Long-winded speech. I think from my perspective, I, I touched on a little bit in the last press conference. Um, the shuttle program, uh, to me, was, a, was an evolutionary step off of the planet and into, and into the heavens, and, and we'd, we have learned to live and work in low Earth orbit, and we've done that pretty well. Have, have we learned everything? Well, of course not, not yet, but it was, it was a good step. It was a good step along the way, and, and, and I, think, I think we as a species need to be thinking about living off this planet long term, very long term. And, and, and to me, that ought to, to me, Mike Leinbach, that ought to be the mission uh, for us as, as a species, to think about living off this planet. And then what do you do to, to, to do that? Well, we've learned to live and operate in low Earth orbit. We need to learn to live on another body. We, we've touched the moon. I believe personally that the moon is a good, uh, a good destination to go learn how to live on another body. 
um, get that experience behind us. And so we can take those next logical steps away from, from Mother Earth and live beyond uh, what we've known all of our, all of our lives. And, and uh, so an, another evolutionary step, I believe, is the way we should go. Um, I'm not the policymaker, I'm the implementer, and so if, uh, I need to be uh, told what to do. Bill. Uh, Bill Harwood, two more quick ones for Mike Leinbach. Um, have you guys gotten any update on the crowd estimates that they're seeing? Is it still 500 to 750 that they're talking about? And is there anything in this flow that you're not doing because it's the last flight? Or is this pretty much an ops normal all the way through to post-landing? Let's see. Anything we're not doing. I can't think of anything we're not doing. Let me think about that while I answer the other one. Um, yeah, the estimate is still 500,000 to 750,000 for Friday. If, if for some reason Kathy makes a stay on the ground from a weather perspective Friday, um, you didn't laugh. <laughs> um, then I think over the weekend uh, it'll probably rise a bit. In fact, our, our security forces are saying it may go up a little bit over the weekend. But it, it's going to be jam-packed uh, regardless of what day we launch. Um, anything we haven't done? I, I, I can't think of anything. I, I can't think of anything. Tom Abrams, KTRK in Houston. What does it say to you that so many people would make their way here to, to watch that final launch? Uh, pride in the program, pride in America. Um, uh, I'll be honest with you, I wish it had, had, had picked up years ago um, because I, I, I think we've lost uh, the interest of, of some of the American people. Uh, and, and so when you see the last one, you, you want to race down to Florida and, and see it so you can have check that off your bucket list. Um, and that's good. That's fine. Uh, I, I wish we had, had been able to maintain the interest of the American people a bit better than we had in the, uh, over the life of the program. Not that we haven't done that. I just don't think we've done it as, as good as we could have. Okay, we'll take uh, one more question for um, Irene, please. Thanks. I, Irene Klotz with Reuters, um, probably for Mike uh, Moses. And uh, this may actually be more of a space station question, but perhaps you um, – we would, you know, the answer. Um, has NASA done any uh, risk assessments on uh, kind of long-term, uh, um, uh, I guess, just a long-term risk of space station having just a single um, crew transportation system for the foreseeable future? I don't know if they've specifically looked at that. We, we've been in this situation before. Uh, after Columbia, we were down to rely on just on the Soyuz. Um, and so it, it's not an unexpected thing. So the reliability numbers of, the, of their rocket system and their launch capabilities, um, but we're not down to a single system. We're down to a single system for crew, but we now have the ATV uh, from the European Space Agency and the HTV from the Japanese Space Agency as resupply ships. Uh, both are doing fantastic um, and, and able to take up a, a, a literally tons of cargo. Um, and so we, we're in actually a much better situation than we were back when we had the Columbia stand down. But from a crew perspective, yeah, we are in that situation. If you think about it from a crew safety and rescue standpoint, we've always relied on Soyuz as our rescue vehicle to get crews off of station. Um, and so I know they've done the math. I, just, I don't know the specifics if they looked at this time period and this exposure period for what that means to them. I guess just following up on that for a minute then, um, if station is, as you all have been saying, the kind of the ultimate crowning legacy of the shuttle program, do you think it's being left at risk um, having only one way to get up there? I don't think it's at risk per se. It's, um, you know, obviously a better, uh, a better plan, better is a tough word, a, a, a more uh, uh, robust plan would have had redundancy built in, a, a follow-on ready to go before the first one's retired and a stepping stone type of approach. Um, we just didn't get to that. So are we putting anything at risk? Yeah, probably, but is it unacceptable risk? No, I don't believe so. Um, there's, you know, the Russian, the Russian system is unbelievably robust. And, and like I said, our, our international partners with their resupply capability can, can really do a great job. We're gonna get our commercial uh, cargo resupply underway. Uh, we're talking about commercial crew resupply. Um, and so all those things are gonna happen. And so station's, uh, station's a pretty good animal. Um, you look at its reliability and its performance, it's doing way better than the, the numbers show in terms of what maintenance it would have required by now, what, what events you're, you would have need by now. You look at the space shuttle and, and you kind of, what you're missing is that work platform that lets you do the unexpected. So it's got the robot arm, it's got the airlock, it's got a dedicated crew, it's got a giant payload bay. And so to, to handle those unexpected things, those unexpected things are 
mostly all behind us. Assembly was the big unexpected. Make sure everything fits together. If it doesn't, you got the ability to then redo things. You got the ability to put that module back in the shuttle payload bay and return it if you had to. Um, now that assembly's over and we're more in a maintenance utilization standpoint, a lot of those big unknowns are kind of gone. Now it's just a keep operating kind of thing. And so you're able to go to a little different model of operation where not having the shuttle around is not as big a risk as it would have been had we, had we tried to stop years ago. Okay, I think that's all for the questions we have. Jim, did you have one more follow-up? We'll take one more from Jim, uh, follow-up, and then we'll conclude the briefing. Uh, Jim Siegel, Celebration Independent Newspaper. If there continues to be uh, unexpected delays, whether whether or some other reason, is there a point at which you're going to run into a budget problems, or, or is that a factor here? No, so yeah, um, there's no actual uh, checkbook that's going to expire or anything like that. So no, we're, we're, we got the funding to do what we need to for the launch window we have. Like I said, if we, if we have to move to the other side of Delta, that's not, there's nothing stopping us from doing that. Um, so no, no constraints there. Uh, and from that perspective, it's exactly the right place to have the launch team. There's no external pressures to worry about from a, from a schedule standpoint. And that will conclude today's STS-135 pre-launch news conference. Up next on NASA <coughs> television at 1 p.m. Eastern is the International Space Station Science and Technology News Conference. For more information on the STS-135 mission and crew, please visit www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you.